Well, good to see everyone again today as we continue in the book of Romans. It's a great book. Lots of stuff, and I know that uh, we're not doing it all the justice it deserves by kind of uh, taking a whole bunch of verses at a time. Um, So for your homework, as I always like to give you homework, um, come back and and relook at some of these chapters and spend a little more time in them. Um, I want to get some preliminary things out of the way. I've I've broken up uh, this portion of uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 17 into four different areas. And uh, before we get into those, I wanted to get some preliminary things out of the way. First of all, we just did Romans 7 last week, and wasn't that a blessing? And everybody's going, what are you talking about? It was pretty depressing. It is pretty depressing when Paul keeps saying, I do what I don't want to do, and I can't do what I want to do. But what I saw it as a blessing is that's my life. I saw it as a, as, as a testimony to what I live. And uh, instead of being frustrated and defeated and depressed and, and downtrodden, I, w- I found those words of comfort in Paul. And, and it really does uh, give us a... Um, if, if Paul is saying that, you know, the greatest Christian to live in the first century, then it bodes well for us that um, actually experience this on sometimes a daily basis. And the move from Romans 7 to Romans 8 is quite distinctive. We'll get into that uh, later on, but just to to tell you that Romans 8, as I said in the note on on, uh, the invite today through the Facebook invite, is it's one of the most beloved chapters in the New Testament, and if not, the entire Bible. We're just going to go through uh, the first 17 verses. And yes, it's a tall order what Paul does in just these 17 verses. He presents the gospel to us. Verse 5 to to 8 talks about the mind. Verse 9 to 11 gets into the indwelling. And I really want to spend some time there. And of course, the grand end of this portion from 12 to 17, I mean, talking about the errors of God, um, I still try to even wrap my mind around the fact that Paul tells us we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Can we even utter that we are his fellow brothers and sisters? So in this... um, The other big distinction I want to get, so the Romans 7, Romans 8, huge distinction between the two. The other one is the idea of spirit versus flesh. And so um, one time I did preach to you guys on the world and how it invades our uh, life and how it comes in. and, And so we have the sin, we have the world, and we have Satan. And the world is, and always the talk was, you know, we're defeated in our flesh. It's not really our flesh, our, our physical flesh. The word is sarx in the Greek, and it's really talking about our sinful nature. And then the spirit, really in Romans 7, it was the spirit, the human spirit. And here we're talking about the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So there's quite a distinction to be made. So, you know, Romans 7, internal uh, battle that goes on. Um, Romans chapter 8, it's whether you're a believer or not. And, and for those who are not believers and are here today, I invite you to, to soak in these verses because they are really telling us where we're, we're headed and, and how you can know and how you can ask for the Spirit today and have Him indwelling you right now. I uh, want to move on to the, the importance of Romans 8. We're going to take in the next couple of Sundays the rest of this chapter, and it just has this fantastic crescendo as it continues to pound. Paul takes a lot of time in Romans chapter 8 to really outline truly what it is to be a believer in Christ. And I'll finish with my final point of our preliminary things is the assurance of the believer. If there isn't any other passage in Scripture and they're Paul's writing, the Lord does a a, a phenomenal job in John chapter 10. But here, Paul really unpacks the assurance of the believer, and we will look at one single verse that really 
knocks it home for us. So, I'm going to ask you three questions to prime us for thinking about today. What cry will you make? And you go, well, what are you talking about here? Well, we saw in Romans chapter 7, one of the final verses, verse 24, there is a cry that says, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? And culturally, that actually had a massive significance. Under Roman rules, there was a time where if you were guilty of murder, you would have to strap on the corpse of that body and live with it. And as that body would eat into your body, the cry would be, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Now that graphic picture is really sometimes the life of the believer where we have sunk so low and we're making that cry. The second cry is the one I trust you will have is when we come to it in verse 13 as Abba Father. Or verse 15, Abba Father. What cry will you make? Are you experiencing God's presence? Are you experiencing God's presence? We're going to unpack the indwelling. And are you actually plugged in to the Holy Spirit and what he can do for our lives? I know I'm not in, fully in, let me tell you right off. I have wrestled and struggled. One of the things about the Trinity is we elevate God, the Father, We worship Jesus, the Son. We focus on what he has done for us. We focus on who he is. And then, oh yeah, then there's the Spirit. Well, I mean, one way of thinking it is Old Testament, God the Father, kind of Yahweh, Jehovah was through a few Christophanies sprinkled in there, Holy Spirit popping in, popping off, and that's the other thing permanent indwelling versus the sort of spirit is here, spirit left me. Then we have Jesus in the whole New Testament, that whole period of time where Jesus is elevated and and his whole histories are unfolded, his biographies. And then the church age, day of Pentecost, that's the period of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit has had a full-time ministry for the last 2,000 years, and yet He's still the third chair of the Trinity. And he's, in my books, the third chair. And I've got to bring him up and, and give him the full due and honor that the third person of the Trinity truly needs. In fact, Dr. Robert Mount says this. How important is life in the Spirit? How to live in and by the Spirit is the single most important lesser, sorry, lesson a believer can ever learn. Say it again. How to live in and by the Spirit is the single most important lesson a believer can ever learn. Think about that. And about all the things you need to know as a Christian, it struck me for a moment. It certainly puts the Holy Spirit in a new light. Verse 1 and 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Wow. There it is. Paul just starts right off the bat. This is the gospel. No condemnation. Can you just pause there? We just talked about the last time I was here, we have peace with God. That is the peace where we lay down our arms. We're not warring anywhere anymore. The battle is over, but now there's no condemnation. Not in the past, not in the present, not in the future. Talk about the presence of sin, the power of sin, and the penalty of sin. All disappear with this no condemnation. What else do we got here? 
It's in Jesus Christ, for those who are in Jesus Christ. It's not sort of an optional thing. There's no condemnation universalism. There's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. If you are in Jesus Christ, you made that profession of salvation. You've accepted his gift of eternal life. You've given it all over. You're off the throne. He's on the throne. You have no condemnation. And, and then it goes on to tell us how we've been set free. There's so many things that the world is trying to set itself from. Freedom is a big word in our times. We don't have time to unpack freedom. But being set free is, in some places, the object of their entire lives is to be set free. Set free from so many things even set free from where there are present circumstances. There's a lot of war-torn places. There is a lot of places where people are living in poverty and all kinds of different things, marginalized, and are looking to be set free. Christian, I'm telling you today, brothers and sisters, you are and have been set free. God has done. God has done. Not God is doing. God will do. God has done. Verse 3. It's done. So, nothing for us to do. We always talk about the done religion, not the do religion. And again, we always get a little worked up about the word religion in our circles. But it's the done religion. It's already done. What has he done? sent his own son. We celebrate that all the time. But it wasn't just sending his own son because that would have just been Christmas every day. He sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh. He's like us. Remember fellow heirs? How can we be fellow heirs with someone? Not only are we made in the image of God, but he sent his son in our sin, like our sinful flesh, but no sin. And I won't get into whether he was able not to sin or able to sin, but at this point, it's sinful flesh, likeness of sinful flesh. And what? For sin, the problem, for sin. Everyone's talking about, no, no, live a good life. Live um, uh, an honorable life. Live a life that you can reflect back and leave your legacy. No, there's one thing that plagues humanity, sin. He sent him not just in sinful flesh, so that we're all the same, but for sin. And then he condemned sin in the flesh. So then it was not just some sort of, okay, let's see if this works. This is our plan B, plan A didn't work, plan C is in the back up here. No, this was the plan from the foundation of the earth, and it did the work. It has been accepted. He said it is finished, and he was received in glory. So it did condemn sin in the flesh. Again, stop looking at flesh as body. Look at it as condemned sin in our sinful nature. And for what? In order that the righteous requirement of law may be fulfilled. See, he came in and he said this. I did not abolish the law. I actually fulfilled it, he said in in the great Sermon of the Mount. And that was his object at all times. It says the law is fine, but look what happened to the law. It was weakened by the flesh in verse 3. The law was fine, but it was our sin, our choice in the garden that's been carried throughout the imputed and parted sin through generations and generations that we now, and then of course our own personal sin that we're guilty of, that weakened the law. And just back it up to verse 2 there, for the law, the spirit of of life, that word law is actually the power. See, we have power on our side. We have the power of the spirit of life. That's what life in the spirit is all about. We have the tools. We have the equipment. We have the wherewithal to fight sin in our lives. It's been done with, but there's that process that we talk about every time we're up here. The sanctification, that forward looking, that future 
resurrection. That future time when all of this will be put away. Verse 4 is, is, is really important here um, because it really speaks about our holiness. Verse 4 is of great importance for our understanding of Christian holiness. First, holiness was the ultimate pers- uh, purpose of the incarnation and the atonement. The end God had in view when sending his son, not our, our justification only through freedom from the com- condemnation of the law that we saw in verse 1, but also our holiness through obedience to the commandments of the law. Like, we're not exempt, eh? Like, the moral law still applies to us. Secondly, holiness consists of fulfilling the just requirement of the law. The moral law has been abolished for us, has not been abolished for us, which I just said. It is to be fulfilled in us. Although law obedience is not the ground, it's not the ground because we're under grace, it is the fruit Didn't we just talk about today's craft, the fruit of the Spirit? We're going to look at Galatians 5 in a a moment, but there's that fruit. You want to know if you know you're a believer? Where's the fruit? If you want to know if a fellow is a believer, where's the fruit? And third, holiness is the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's give him the proper duty. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Romans 7, Romans 7, we just talked about, insists that we cannot keep the law because of our indwelling flesh, sinful nature, slash. Romans 8, 4, insists that we can and must because of the indwelling of the Spirit, which we'll get to. Verse 5 and 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And when you read life and peace, eternal life, peace slash shalom. Like the full concept of peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, here's the mind. And when we talk about the mind, we're talking about it in this sense. To set the mind on the flesh means to think continually about constantly desiring the things characteristic of fallen, sinful human nature. That is, to think just the way the unbelieving world thinks, emphasizing what it thinks is important, what it pursues, and then disregarding God's will. That's how you set your mind. If any Beatles fan here, George Harrison's great song, I Got My Mind Set On You, well, he says it's going to take a lot of money, it's going to take a lot of patience, and it's going to take a lot of time. Good thing for Christians, we can do it right now. No money, no patience, no time. Today, you could have your mind set on Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So the mind is really the mindset, not something to be uh, you're preoccupied with, but your mindset, your perspective, your worldview, your outlook. Notice the contrast who those are in the flesh slash sinful nature to those who are in the spirit. Death instead of life. Hostile to God. Again, lay down your weapons. No submission. In fact, it says they can't. Like you can't submit. Like you don't have the power to submit. So trying to do it in our own efforts, not going to do it. And you can't please God. Now this is not a holy wrathful God. Oh, do my bidding and I'll be you please me. It's not like that at all. Anyone here who's a Christian knows that God is with us and for us and has sent his son to die on the cross because of our sin. But then what do you have in the spirit? We just talked about it. Life and peace. 
life and peace. And it's not going to end there. Paul does his little thing in verse 17, which we'll have to get to, because we don't have white out in our Bibles. Sorry, we have to read every verse. And um, we're going to get to it, but it's life and peace. And you go, well, I don't know if my life is life and peace, but God will show you the way. Let's get into our next passage here. Verse 9 to 11. This is the indwelling. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ not belonging to him, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life because of righteousness... If the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I mean, do you see the theme in here? Dwell, dwell, dwell. But there's also the condition of if, if, if. You know, you don't get all these benefits of Jesus Christ if you just come to church. You don't get these benefits if you've done a thousand good deeds. You don't get these benefits if you belong to a Christian family or come from a Christian home. You get these benefits because you're in Christ. If you are, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, and that is true for every believer, then you have this indwelling. And don't forget, uh, Paul says in, uh, I think it's sec- no, 1 Corinthians 6, 7, temple of God. We are the temple of God. And here we have the idea of spirit of Christ in verse 9. Spirit of God, spirit of Christ, God living in you. Do you see how the, the whole trinity is in there? Philosophers often urge people to set their minds on eternal things rather than on transitory affairs of this world. Philo condemned those whose minds were taken up with the matters of the body and its pleasures. Philosophers divided humanity into the enlightened and foolish. Judaism divided humanity into Israel and the Gentiles. Paul here divides humanity into two classes, those who have the Spirit and those who are left to their own devices. In this passage, we see three things to notice. First, because of our new nature, we have a brand new life. Like, there is that sense of all things are new, 2 Corinthians 5.17, we are a new creation. And so with our new nature, we actually have a brand new life. Also, this idea of life is we have the promise of a future resurrection. So we may not get all of this, and that, that one thing we, we, we fall uh, to a lot of times is our emotions and our feelings and, you know, what our weeks look like from time to time. And that gets us into this place where we just don't have the sense. But the future resurrection is promised to each one of us. Thirdly, one mark of a genuine Christian is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We've been saying that. He actually takes up residence inside those who know Jesus Christ. There's a passage I'd like to take us to, the Second Corinthians chapter 7. I don't have it up here. 23 verses. Here's the whole building of the temple. David wanted to do it, and uh, God says, sorry, you're not going to do it. Your son Solomon then gets all the things and Aaron brings the cedars from Lebanon, and um, there's just all this work going on. Finally, the temple is complete. And then we read this. So then, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. 
You see, God set us in the garden, and after that, go and fill the earth. We were the ones to fill the earth. We build a temple, and He fills the temple. He's filling us up again. He is coming back. Where God and earth and humanity meets is at the temple. Right then it was that physical temple. Right now it's us. And are we now experiencing this presence, I said, that question I gave to you? Are we feeling it? Here, the Old Testament illustration shows us in a permanent sense forever in the New Testament dispensation. Are we feeling the Spirit's presence? We won't have time to do all of the justice to these verses, but for verse 12 to 17, it reads this. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if to the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. Now that's a lot. And uh, we'll do it some justice this, morning, this afternoon. But um, right away you see five amazing benefits. Verse 14, led by the Spirit. Like we're not led by us anymore. We give it over, hand it over. Hand the driving, steering wheel. Get off of the podium. Give it all to the Spirit. He's more than happy. Even if you go back to the, oh, uh, sorry, the New Testament, Jesus himself led by the Spirit. Go to Luke, and his gospel will tell you, led by the Spirit several times. Second of all, no fear. One of the other things besides freedom, the opposite of freedom, is fear. The world's living in fear. We have no fear. We don't go back to slavery of fear. Number three, Cry, Abba, Father. I don't know. Like We could spend all day on that one. Father's Day is coming up in June. And there are a lot of unfortunate circumstances where there is no father relationship. But there's all kinds of good and mediocre and bad fathers and all spectrums of fathers. But here's one. We can go and I've wrestled with this, the Aramaic Abba, um, you know, term of endearment, like calling him daddy. Yeah, okay. The, re the reality, it's, it's, a, it's a personal relationship with God. That's what we're trying to get at. It's not God the Almighty, creator of the universe. It is my dad. Remember he says, I'm going to my God and your God and my father and your father. See, the father concept in the Old Testament wasn't it was just sprinkled throughout. Here it's permanent. God the Father is our Father. We can go and cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, theologians have spent a lot of time on this one. But for us, this is our assurance. This is, this is the big one. The Spirit himself bears witness. You see, we could all like, oh, I don't know, am I saved? Like... What is it? Uh, you know, do I have to have that big, momentous, you know, fall down on my ears, tears uh, drenching, or is it just a gradual one day at a time, and all of a sudden, like uh, C.S. Lewis, he's driving in a car, and he, oh yeah, I believe in God. You know, it's like, whoa, uh, what happened? The Spirit himself bears witness. An eyewitness is God himself. You know how many times Jesus in John's Gospel, it's like a trial brief, this bears witness, my works bears witness, the Spirit, God bears witness, 
see my works bear witness, all these witnesses. It's the idea that this here, the Spirit himself, is bearing witness that we are children of God. That is, we are believers, we have eternal life, we have peace, shalom, and then we're heirs of God. Now, I could spend a whole time out talking about even my own old practice where, you know, everybody opens up the will and says, what did I get? What did I get? Like all families warring over wills and warring over this idea that, oh my goodness, I hope I got, you know, the, the Cadillac or I got that. Uh, we're all joint heirs. This is what this is. This is like God opening up the book of life, seeing all our names in it. Oh, I see uh, Rachel, I see Susan, I see Amanda, I see Jamie, I see Stephen, I see David. Like, no challenge here. No go hire a lawyer and, and fight the battle in a courtroom. This is heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Like, embrace that. Embrace that. I won't have time to go into um, the deeds of the body in Galatians chapter 5. We alluded to earlier, but uh, Dr. James Boyce talks about verse 14. He says, points out that we are sons of God is a radical, supernatural, and far-reaching. It's radical because your life has experienced the greatest change that could ever be. Once you've served Satan, now you serve God. Once you walked in darkness... Now you walk in the light. Once you followed your own desires, now you live to please God. And once you were dead, now you're alive. That's a radical change. It's supernatural because only God could do something like that. And it's far-reaching because it touches every aspect of your life. And a couple things I want to say about Roman adoption. So bring it into context. Bring it right back to the first century. Why is Paul writing like this? Why is the readers going to understand this idea? For us, it may be a little foreign, but for this idea of this adoption goes like this. As a legal act, Roman adoption had to be attested by witnesses. The spirit here is attesting to the witness that God adopts the believers it, um, in Jesus as his own children. So that's verse 16. Verse 15 Roman adoption could only take place at, sorry, could take place at any age, canceled all previous debts and relationships, defining the new son and daughter, by the way, that is sons and daughters, so anyone, it's just the term that they use for the translation, but it means sons and daughters, defining the new son and daughter wholly in terms of this new relationship to his father, whose heir he has thus become. New name, all debts cancelled, new family, now an heir of that family. And my, sorry, back to some uh, uh, entertainment uh, reference, Ben-Hur, my favorite movie, sorry, but as much as it is, it's steeped in history, because it is a period piece, and you see when Ben-Hur a galley slave sent to die becomes Arius' son by putting the ring and the robe and all that stuff. And now he has a new name. All his debts is canceled. His whole sentence is wiped out. And of course, later on, he rejects that because he wants to go and find his family. But the, the picture is there for us. The Roman adoption for us now is happening. A word on, uh, a word on uh, suffering in verse 17. Sorry, he brings that up again. Remember I, last time we were at peace, there was a whole lot of suffering. He brings the suffering again. God is not their stern judge, but their confident and helper. And he makes them children by adoption. There is an inward sense of sonship, as we saw. There is a promise of the present and future inheritance on the condition that we receive not so much life and peace, but the cross that the gospel calls 
for as well as the crown that it promises. See, the way of the crown is through the way of the cross. The way of the cross is the only path to the glory awaiting fellow heirs of Christ. Right? Christ suffered. We will suffer. The gospel means strength for trials, not escape from them. Not escape from them. So, life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. These short 17 verses give us this. We have a choice. We have the answer. The answer is to live according to the Holy Spirit. When we do this, we'll be directed by Him in everything we do. Our lives will never be ordinary. They'll be extraordinary. This freedom comes from the understanding of this amazing truth that Christ has redeemed you from an empty way of life full of rules and regulations. You are free and called to live a life worthy of your calling. Today, you may start renewing your mind to this monumental truth. I trust you will see it operating in your life. Furthermore, God provides everything your redemption for your redemption to enable you to live a life worthy of your calling. He wants you to live a victorious life by the Spirit of God. You are worthy on the basis of the value that Jesus assigns to you. He died for you to bring you into fellowship with the Father. We are who we are to disagree with such a who are we to disagree with such a wonderful gift. Today it is my prayer that you will drop whatever burdens you are carrying at the feet of Jesus. He has already borne them, so you should not have to. I trust you understand the incredible grace you've been given. And finally, aren't you glad that your rights as God's child wasn't left to emotions and feelings? He guaranteed it through the Holy Spirit, which he sent into your hearts to continually confirm that you are his child. He is speaking love over you. He is pouring grace over you. He has given you over, world overcoming power to live the life of victory in this present time. I trust this revelation of your sonship, daughtership, bless you today and change your future. So, to sum, life in spirit is an invitation from God to live the life he wanted you to enjoy. Life eternal and peace shalom. That whenever suffering enters into that life and peace, you can cry, Abba, Father. And he will give you the strength to endure, not avoid, as a fellow heir of Jesus Christ. So our three questions. What are you going to cry? Wretched man that I am, or Abba, Father? Are you actually experiencing God, the Holy Spirit's presence, as he once filled the temple that they couldn't even get into it? It was just fully consumed. And that's what he's doing to us. He's fully in. There is a sense of uh, a supernatural filling when, you know, oh, I got filled by the Spirit. But there's a time of Pentecost when we all came to Christ that we have a permanent indwelling. And there's sometimes, and that's again for a future time, to talk about a special indwelling of the Spirit for a, a particular work. But that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is with you 24-7. And are you plugged in to the life in the Spirit? I know I need to do a lot of homework on this. I need to stop and ponder and think about where I stand in the Spirit. I look at my library and I got maybe 200 books on Jesus, 20 books on, on God the Father, and about two books on the Spirit. Um, and it's just the nature uh, of us in a uh, very um, uh, materialistic where we can comprehend Jesus being in person. We understand God the Father as being the creator of all things. Just not giving the Holy Spirit his due place in our lives. So at this time we'd like to uh, pause and I'll pray and then we'll uh, move into our communion. So Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for these um, verses that just show the wonder of your Spirit the wonder of your love, the wonder of your grace poured on us. You sent forth your Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
You've uh, given us the power to set our minds on, on you and on, on the Spirit. Father, to have a permanent indwelling, to be the temple of God. And Father, that we are joint heirs and heirs with, with Jesus Christ is too much to bear sometimes, and that the Spirit himself bears witness to us. So Father, as we open our hearts today to hear these words, let the Spirit come in and do his mighty work in us, and let us be transformed Transform for us to live life eternal and shalom peace in this world and share it with others who need to hear this message. So thank you, Father, for this wonderful message in Romans chapter 8. And we thank you for all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So as we move, um, Let's take a moment to, to ponder these things. Think of the gospel in those four verses that just continually re reminds us of what he's done for us. If you haven't made that step of faith, I invite you to do that. For to set your mind on him, to set your mind with the power of the Spirit. Focus on God and what he has for you. To appreciate and understand and let that Holy Spirit indwell in permeate every aspect of our lives and finally just to appropriate the fact that we are sons and daughters of God. We belong to the family of God. We are children and that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Powerful verses for us today. And now uh, we'll think about that. We have some prayers for those who may be seeking, for those who want to make a step of faith and um, for those who just, like myself, needs a, re a, a constant reminder of the love of God that we can come back and restore our faith.